I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a man was caught up to the third heaven. Visions and revelations, Paul says. He says he doesn't even know if he was physically in heaven or if it was a mere vision given to him by God. But he allows for the possibility that it was a vision, a glimpse of heaven put in his mind by God. From the many passages we've seen, Paul seems to be quite prone to these visions of his. And given this fact, we have quite a good precedent to conclude that his list of appearances in 1 Corinthians 15 are also visions, a gift, as it were. They saw Jesus, but it was a vision of the risen Jesus. God was revealing Jesus to them at various times. This would mean that this passage in no way corroborates the Gospels, but rather contradicts them. And it also calls into question whether the earliest Christians had seen anything more than the product of their own fevered imaginations. So, it seems we have a few options here. One, the entire passage was written by Paul and he intended to mean a physical appearance by Jesus. But this contradicts the Gospels and Acts, and it seems to contradict Paul in several other places. Plus, would Paul ever have referred to the disciples as the Twelve? Two, this entire passage is a later insertion by someone other than Paul, but the problem there is that the language matches Paul's very closely, and the continuity from verse 2 to 3 and from 8 to 9 seems intact, and there are no manuscripts without the passage. 3. Only some of the passage has been altered by a later hand, namely the insertion of the reference to the twelve disciples and the over 500 figure, and Paul wrote the rest of it and meant a physical appearance, which still contradicts the Gospels and Acts. Or 4. Paul did indeed write the passage minus the reference to the twelve and the five hundred people, but his use of horao meant a vision, a hallucination experience, seeing Jesus in his mind's eye. This still contradicts the Gospels and Acts, but it explains so much more than the other options. There are many reasons for going with this final option. Paul seems ignorant of all the gospel details about Jesus. He is prone to having visions. He explicitly denies hearing about Jesus from anyone. He says that it is scripture alone that is the source of the gospel, not recent events. But now what I want to do is look at the passage after we remove the parts about the 12 and the 500. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He hath been raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then He appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to the child untimely born, He appeared to me also. Perfect! The flow is much better. Paul mentions Cephas, then James, then the rest of the apostles, with no mention of disciples, since Paul never uses this in any of his other letters. When we read the parts about Jesus appearing, we can now see that Paul in no way is trying to shore up his claim at all. He is simply recounting the visions as they happened to first Cephas, then James, and then the other apostles, such as John, and lastly, himself. And we can see further corroboration that Paul is not trying to shore up the resurrection claim, because in the very next verse, verse 9, Paul talks about his apostleship, not Jesus' resurrection. This also provides an elegant explanation for why Cephas and James are listed separately from the twelve disciples. 
The person who inserted the reference to the Twelve did so without much forethought. He likely read the Cephas line, realized by scanning the next lines that no mention of the disciples was present, inserted the very short line, then to the Twelve, which would also imply that the copyist did not equate Cephas with Peter. Then he realized he wanted to continue to embellish with the reference to the 500 people, which may have been, by his time, a part of the tradition. And then he went back into copy mode, which explains why the references to Cephas and James are split and not included as part of the 12 disciples. This was clearly a spur-of-the-moment insertion. The simple explanation is that Paul knew of no empty tomb on earth because his Jesus was not an earthly Jesus. God revealed the entirety of the gospel to men such as Paul via the prophetic scriptures, such as Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22. But for argument's sake, let's assume an earthly Jesus here. With so many issues plaguing this passage, Jesus appearing to 12 disciples instead of 11, Cephas not being part of the 12 disciples, James not being listed among the 12 disciples, the disciples referred to in a very nostalgic, reverent way, hinting at a much later time than that of Paul, the clearly contrived figure of 500 plus believers who saw Jesus, and the physical appearance to Paul, which would put Jesus' ascension on quite a holding pattern which of course contradicts the Gospels and Acts, combined with the fact that none of it can actually be verified in any way, I ask you, how can this passage be used as any reliable evidence for the claim that someone came back to life almost 2,000 years ago? I believe this passage, minus the later insertions, is a corroboration of Paul's belief that Jesus was never on earth and that he was seeing a vision of the risen Jesus in his mind's eye. Paul was a man who admitted being prone to visions, driven to seeing salvation from not only the oppressive mosaic law he found himself under, but from the stinging finality of death itself, a salvation, a gospel, which had been hidden since the beginning of time a gospel which appeared to him from the pages of Hagias Graphi, the Holy Scriptures. In the next video, we'll take a look at the non-biblical historical evidence that we can dredge up for Jesus' resurrection. Don't laugh, it might be a rather short video. See you there.